Hi, welcome. Um, I'm Megan Friedman, a reporter with Hearst Connecticut Media, and today uh, we have the opportunity to sit down with Dr. Sarah Lowe. Uh, she is a clinical psychologist um, with the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at Yale School of Public Health. Um, a lot of her work has focused on mental health after uh, disasters and um, traumatic events, so she's going to talk with us today about tips for staying mentally healthy during the pandemic, um, whether you are self-isolating or going into work, and um, about what issues COVID-19 might be exacerbating in people's personal lives. So, um, Dr. Lowe, I wonder if you can just sort of start by uh, talking about what your, what your concerns are uh, as this unfolds, um, and what particular issues it might exacerbate. I'm sure it, it, I'm sure it has a wide spectrum, but um, if you could just speak to a few of the, the main points, that would be great. First of all, thank you for having me. Um, so basically in terms of what we can expect for mental health, we know from um, a large body of research on the consequences of disaster. So I feel like this is very much a disaster. It's a life-threatening event that's affecting um, not just individuals, but entire communities on a, on a global scale. Um, so we know that disasters are associated with trauma-related disorders. So these are disorders for which um, a potentially traumatic event is a prerequisite. So PTSD, mm -hmm. which is characterized by um, nightmares, avoidance, um, irritation, depression, anger, as well as hypervigilance, difficulty sleeping, um, as well as its uh, sort of precursor, which is acute stress disorder. And these are um, similar reactions that happen within the first month of exposure, um, as well as complicated grief. So those are sort of in the box of trauma-related conditions. But then we also know that um, the other mental health conditions tend to be exacerbated by exposure to mass trauma, including major depressive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, and substance use disorder. But then even on top of that, there are many conditions that don't necessarily meet criteria for a mental disorder, but you know, can be distressing and troubling and, and uh, make it difficult for people to function in their lives. So this would be just like general perceived stress or psychological distress, um, substance use that um, might not qualify for substance use disorder, but can be troubling and inter interfering, um, disordered eating, um, so you know, binge eating, um, or you know, disrupted meal schedules um, in children, um, mood and anxiety symptoms, and conduct or behavioral problems that don't necessarily meet criteria for disorders. So I think those are the, th the three different categories. Um, I guess for COVID-19, what concerns me the most is um, just it, the characteristics that differentiates it from other forms of disaster, um, namely its long duration, um, so, you know, with, with hurricanes and earthquakes, like the main exposure is over within a matter of, you know, hours or days, and then people are in recovery mode. This is, you know, we're seeing much, much longer. Um, I think the geographic scope of, is unprecedented um, in terms of, you know, every country, most countries are affected. Um, you know, every state within the United States is impacted. Um, so that's gonna tax our you know, social and emotional resources quite a bit. Um, and then it's having tr tremendous financial consequences that will be likely enduring. And we know from um, natural disasters that it's often the financial strain and these longer term downstream consequences of the initial exposure that have um, longer term effects on mental health. And then do you think that there are going to be people who maybe haven't experienced things, people who this might trigger uh, about with depression or anxiety, like clinical depression or anxiety that they haven't experienced before? Or do you think the bigger concern is for people who were struggling to begin with? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we know from previous uh, trauma that the people who are at, some of the people who are at greatest risk are people who have pre-existing mental health conditions, um, be them depression, post-traumatic stress, anxiety, but I think you're right that there are probably some people who this could be a tipping point into um, symptom severity that would qualify for a disorder. And then when you talk about what makes this disaster unusual, that it 
that it has a global impact, that it's a long duration. I mean, there's also the uncertainty ele element. We don't know when it's going to end. Um, the other piece of this is the isolation. Mm -hmm. um, I would imagine that for people with depression, um, with anxiety, with substance abuse issues, if you can't see your support system, it could really cause you a lot of trouble. Um, Definitely. Any tips for, you know, how to sort of combat that? And for people like, especially people who live alone, I mean, there's just a lot, there's a lot there to dig through. Definitely. I mean, I think you're right in that a lot of the things that people do to cope with mental health problems, they can't do during this time. You know, they can't go to the gym. They can't get together with friends, go out and see a movie, things like that. Um, and I think you're right also that people who live alone are at greater risk um, because even if they're connecting with people socially, it's different from physically being there. Um, in terms of what people living alone and anyone really can do to connect um, is being really purposeful about their social connections. Like we all have people in our lives, you know, family, friends, coworkers, neighbors, and checking in with people in a way that's not ad hoc. So thinking ahead of like, who are the people in my life that I want to check in with? Who are the people I'm going to check in with today? And when am I going to do it? And, you know, sort of factoring that into your daily schedule um, so that you are having those social connections. And I think people are finding really, you know, creative and unique ways to connect with others, um, you know, through things like Zoom and, and other apps that allow multiple people to talk at once. You know, you hear about, you know, these happy hours and um, game nights um, through, through the internet um, and people connecting with neighbors, you know, by putting up signs and things like that. So, you know, I think even though we are physically distant, it doesn't mean we have to be socially distant. And is that a two-way street? So let's say you're someone who doesn't normally struggle with mental health issues is struggling as everyone is but doing pretty okay um should you be making an active effort to reach out to people in your life especially those you know live alone or maybe deal with depression or some sort of other disorder um definitely so i think it's on all of us like obviously not just the people who are struggling to think about people in our networks who may be especially need of you know a phone call or an email or check in um, and, and, and reaching out to those people. And it's, it's hard because we all have, you know, this is a stressful time and, um, you know, we're, many of us are managing working from home and the childcare and things like that. But, you know, making time for people in our lives is really important. And then, um, in terms of, you mentioned not being able to do things like go to the gym. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's a really interesting one. And I know that people are finding different ways to get exercise in, you know, either going on a, a hike in, in a park that's pretty empty um, or uh, taking a, a video class. Um, any other ideas beyond that? And also, if you haven't, let's say you're someone who hasn't really you're not a gym rat, you don't regularly exercise, could that be a way to, could that be something to get into right now that can kind of help you, you know, stay sane and um, build in some routine? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, you know, one piece of advice I have um, is, is what you just said, routines. So yes, this is a, a different time um, and our normal routines are disruptive, but creating a new routine for yourself. Um, so like literally sitting down and making a schedule of, of things you're going to do um, so that you're not just like sleeping all day and sitting on the couch and watching TV. Um, and I think, you know, considering the hours that you might be doing something else on, on a usual basis, that could be a time to take up something like, you know, exercise or Zumba or whatever in the privacy of your own home. Um, you know, I, I would start slow, like I wouldn't go like super intense <laughs> right away if you have an exercise, but you know, exercise is always good, you know, right now and, and always. And if this can be an opportunity for people to pick that up, then that is a, a great thing. What other outlets, um, could be helpful? You know, drawing, writing, uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So 
art, arts and crafts for sure, you know, painting, drawing, journaling, writing. Um, I think a lot of people are finding great pleasure in the arts. So, you know, there's a lot of, it's the golden age of TV and, you know, I'm sure people have a lot of shows they haven't watched. Um, so, you know, doing that, especially like lighthearted content. Um, yeah, like reading, uh, being creative, listening to music, playing music. Um, I think any of that is great. Um, I think people also are finding, you know, other self-care strategies to be um, especially useful now um, and the ones that we can do at home when we're at social distancing, things like, you know, meditation, um, aromatherapy, um, like, you know, even taking like a hot shower or bath, just like these like relaxing, pleasurable experiences can be really valuable anytime and especially now. So I'm just sort of thinking that uh, one of the things that's so difficult is how out of control things can feel. Um, and one kind of buzzword these days is mindfulness. Uh, do you have any tips on how to stay mindful and how to not, a, a lot of people I know just personally, you know, the word spiral comes up a lot of times in the week, you know, out of control. because of the news. How do you find a balance between, for example, uh, staying informed and not going crazy because of your Twitter feed or your Facebook feed? Um, what, you know, social media can help and hurt. Um, yeah. Any tips yeah. for that? But the more time people spend on news and social media, the mm -hmm. more their, their mental health is. And that can certainly be bi-directional. Like people who are depressed and anxious might be more information. But I think probably more likely it's that repeated exposure to aversive details and imagery through the media and social media um, exacerbates mental health risks. So in terms of how to manage that is a, a really good question and something that I really struggle with too. Um, so I think, you know, the key is getting the facts and then cutting yourself off. So identifying a trusted media source, whether it's whatever, like CDC, the World Health Organization, New York Times, your local newspaper, going there for the facts and then you don't have to read the same article a hundred times. Just read read it once and then be done with it. Social media is, it can be a blessing and a curse because people post really inspiring content um, and you know, enrichment activities, um, you know, videos, whatever, but they also often, at least, you know, in, in my feed, post terrible stories. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, selectively to the extent you can, um, taking in social media, but also maybe limiting your time on it. Like saying, I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes looking at my Twitter feed and Facebook feed. But after that, like I need to be done and holding yourself accountable is, I think is important. Um, I'm trying to think there was something else you said that I wanted to comment on. Oh, the, the spiraling and uncontrollability. I think that is something that's really stressful. And I think part of being uh, mindful um, is, is flexibility in one's coping styles. So there are certain things that we can control right now, right? So you can control your own schedule. Um, you can control, you know, the way in which you wash your hands and you take care of yourself through protective gear. Um, and you can control the extent to which you adhere to social distancing. You know, those, there are things that we can control in our lives. Um, the other stuff, I think it's all about um, being mindful of your emotional reactions to it and not trying to push away fear and anxiety and grief, anger, all of that, you know, trying to sort of feel and accept your feelings while also, um, doing things to help you regulate them, whether it's exercise or reaching out to a friend, um, you know, meditating, doing something that you find pleasurable. Um, yeah. So you mentioned certain things that you can control and you, and you mentioned hand washing. And that just sort of got me thinking about maybe people who already suffer, struggle with germophobia or OCD um, or some other uh, disorder that uh, already leads to obsessive clean, cleanliness and hand washing. Um, I, that's sort of a different realm uh, out, aside from you know people whose depression might be exacerbated. Um, any tips for uh, them in distinguishing? what is, it's hard to know what's an overreaction to the news and what's appropriate. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. I think um, people with OCD generally struggle with that. Like how often should you be washing your hands? Like, should you wash your hands after you touch the subway pole or not? Um, so I think um, if you're prone to excessive hand washing, it certainly this could be a trigger. And um, I would hope that the people who have struggled with that have some skills already to manage it. But, um, you know, in general, there are guidelines out there for like when you should wash your hands and how you should wash your hands, like how long and with how much soap, et cetera, and like what temperature water, you know, following those guidelines and then anything else beyond that, um, keeping track of it. Um, so ex exposure and response prevention. So preventing yourself from, um, you know, doing that excessive hand washing. And also, um, of course, you don't want to expose yourself to the virus, but maybe expose, exposing yourself to things that you know are safe. Um, so, you know, whether it's stuff that's already in your house or, um, you know, they found that the virus can only live on cardboard for 48 hours. So if you mm -hmm. have that package that's been sitting out for three days, you know, expose yourself mm -hmm. and, and, you know, let it sit before washing. Yeah. And, you know, I say that as someone who's not a virologist, um, <laughs> yeah. I think you, you know, brought up a really good point that it is hard for people who are trying to sort out, you know, whether they have OCD or not, like what is a real threat and what isn't yeah. uh, in this scary time. Yeah. Um, you said, hopefully, um, people who struggle with that already have some skills kind of in their toolbox. Um, and I got to thinking about, you know, therapy and people who maybe didn't start before this all happened and, and could really use it. Um, is now a good time to start? Is that our resources even available? Um, I imagine it can seem daunting to some people when you can't even leave your house. Like, how are you supposed to connect with a therapist? Um, yeah, any tips for that? Yeah, I mean, I think we've had some great advances in telemedicine and web-based therapy, um, and a lot of people are ramping up those services that didn't mm -hmm. happen before. Um, so I think, you know, there are a variety of options for people who are struggling. There are hotlines. So, um, you know, whether you're struggling with suicidal thoughts, domestic violence, um, distress related to COVID-19, there are places you can call. So for disaster-related distress, um, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration has a distress hotline that you can just Google. It's a 1-800 number. Um, there are text-based services, um, such as through the Crisis Text Line and the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI, who I will say, like, if you go to their website, they have a great PDF that has resources for mental health um, during the COVID pandemic. That's really excellent. Um, and then in terms of connecting with the therapist, I mean, I think it's a good a time as any, right? Mm -hmm. um, and people are still, therapists are still out there working, you know, whether they're in their offices or, or mostly from home. So in terms of finding someone, some things you can do are contact your primary care physician for a referral. Um, oftentimes insurance companies require you to have a referral in the first place. So that is a good point of contact. And, you know, if you already have a relationship with a primary care physician, like that's a good person to um, be in touch with. Um, Second, looking at your insurance company website, you can find people who are in network. And so because they're a network, it's going to be more affordable. Um, then additionally, you can go on the SAMHSA website. They have a behavioral treatment and substance use treat treatment locator. And it's, it's a really great tool because it has like, it has boxes you can check off for, um, you know, sliding scale um, and, or different um, types of presenting concerns um, as well. And then, I guess those are my big ones. I mean, community mental health centers, I'm sure are, are, are struggling right now, but it's, it's worth being in touch to see what type of web-based or telemedicine services they're offering. Yeah. Um, so there actually, there is a lot out there. Um, it's just a matter of, of finding the right resources. So you shouldn't hesitate because there's a pandemic. You can still... Absolutely yeah. not hesitate. Um, help is out there um, and, and people are, are doing great work to offset the psychological toll of the pandemic. And then any tips um, for people who maybe live with someone who struggles with mental illness, um, how to be supportive and also take care of yourself? 
Yeah, that's a good question. So in terms of being supportive, um, I would say a very important thing is validation. So um, not telling someone like, you know, just get over it or like maybe if you did this, it would help. Just sitting with them in their pain and saying, this is a really hard time for you. It's a really scary time. Like this is depressing. Like, yes, your feelings are real and listening to what they have to say, like first and foremost, and expressing empathy, and then working with them to decide what they can do to help cope with their symptoms. Um, and that may be, you know, things that they can do while they're social distancing, or it could be um, reaching out to a professional. And then in terms of supporting yourself too, I think like same thing, it's, it, it is hard. Um, both struggling with mental health problems and being someone who loves someone who's struggling. So paying attention to your own feelings, um, knowing what works for you in terms of coping and seeking support for yourself as well. And, you know, whether it's through other friends or loved ones or through a professional source. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to turn the conversation a bit uh, to talk about this idea of positivity um, because there's a lot of people who have been asking for positive news. Um, but I, first I wondered if, before we switch to that, is there anything else that you think I missed that you want to add in terms of, you know, tips to, um, get through this? Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else really. Yeah. I mean, I think one thing I would also say is like, yes, we want to have a nursing system that works both in giving and receiving support, but it's important not to co-ruminate, as they say, which is, you know, get together and talk about, I saw this terrible news story mm -hmm. and talk about this and that, like that actually can make things worse. So being mindful about the nature of your relationships and what you're talking about and whether it's actually helpful for you. So sort of getting away from, you know, talking about Star Wars or something that is not, not related to COVID-19, you mean? Yeah. Being mindful of that in your conversations. You don't want to avoid COVID-19 because it's yeah. all around us and it's, you know, very consuming. But at the same time, you know, checking yourself and your friends about that type of exposure that's beyond just getting the facts. Got it. Um, okay. So the other piece of this interview that I really wanted to touch on, um, I, a lot of people... Uh, so I reached out, I put out some inquiries on social media um, and, and via email yesterday to ask people, you know, what positive stories are they seeing? Because at the same time as there's all this terrible stuff going on, there's so many people sewing homemade masks and making sure older folks have food and thanking healthcare workers. And on in the networks that I work, I have heard a lot of people ask uh can we get more positive news like i really need that right now like um, mass traumatic events like the pandemic like terrorist attacks like disasters have a way of bringing communities together mm -hmm. and i definitely think we should showcase that and celebrate it because it does um, have a positive impact on everybody's mental health okay um so that that is a valid tool to to uh, keep yourself, keep your mind health, healthy. Any tips for staying optimistic? Yeah, so I think, you know, the idea of staying positive and optimistic, of course, we don't want to have positivity that is associated with denial of mm -hmm. severity of the virus or avoidance of um, negative feelings. So sometimes there's a push to like stay positive um, and not feel the depression, the anger, the anxiety and fear you feel. So I think it has to come hand in hand with those negative emotions. Um, in terms of staying optimistic, I do think that looking to community action and getting engaged oneself um, can instill a sense of, of hope um, for everyone. Um, there's that. There's also um, sort of having a, a longer term perspective on the situation. Um, like I think there's very good reason to believe that we will all get through this. It's just gonna take time. 
like human beings have gotten through a lot already um, without the technological advances that we have now. Um, so one of the most inspiring memes that I've seen is the one, I don't know if you've seen it, but the one that's like a doctor in 2040, um, like telling the patient that they need to get the COVID-19 vaccine and the patient being like, I don't know, like I heard it wasn't that serious. Like, even though that's like, oh, that would be ridiculous. The idea that there is some future where we do have a vaccine and people totally take it for granted. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, so sort of, we, we often call it like stretching time. So, you know, not thinking just about the short-term future, but thinking like years out from now and how the world's going to look. Um, and then also thinking about how, and I kind of alluded to this already, how humans have um, recovered from other major mass trauma. Um, like New York City is really struggling right now, but they've been through 9-11 and they came out stronger. Um, and so there's, there's no reason to believe that they won't be able to do that again. Um, so I think for me that fosters a real sense of, of um, optimism. Um, yeah, I mean, those are really the only things I can think of. Yeah, and then also knowing that, okay, so another thing I would say is that we know from mass trauma, first, that most people are psychologically resilient, right? So most people, if you look at them over time, are going to have very low symptoms and be fine. But we also know that many people experience post-traumatic growth. So um, challenges like the pandemic um, for a lot of people lead to at least perceived psychological changes, whether they map onto real life change is like a whole ish, like issue, but stronger relationships, a greater appreciation of life, um, a sense of new possibilities, um, a greater sense of purpose, enhanced spirituality. And I think those are all things that are already coming out of this terrible time that we're living through.